This is John Daly in Rouen, France. The procession which is to take Joan of Arc, the maid of Orleans, to the stake on this morning of May 30th, 1431, is behind schedule. We had expected that it would be here at the Rouen prison castle in which Joan of Arc is chained in a dungeon, but when we went on the air, we expected it, but evidently something has happened to cause a delay, and the procession is still nowhere in sight. The sentence of the French ecclesiastical court, which condemned her for heresy, is about to be carried out. And unless this 19-year-old farm girl, called by some a saint and by some a witch, admits to having served the devil, unless she bows to the will of the court and recants, Joan of Arc will die in the flames before this hour is over. This crowd outside the prison castle here keeps looking in the direction from which the procession will come. There are some several hundred men, women, and children here. They're Burgundian French, allies of the English, and hostile to Joan of Arc. May 30th, 1431, Rouen, France. CBS is there. Joan of Arc faces the stake. The maid of Orleans can renounce her visions and live or hold to her faith and die. CBS takes you back 517 years to the day in the Middle Ages that changed the course of French history. All things are as they were then except for one thing. CBS is there. CBS is there, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon, is based on authentic historical fact and quotation. And now... May 30th... 1431, the prison castle at Rouen and John Daly. It's a beautiful spring day, a day hard to reconcile with the grim event that is about to take place if it takes place. The burning of Joan will be at the old market square here in Rouen, a short distance away from this prison. When the procession arrives, the authorities will make one more effort to break Joan's will. They will bring her from her dungeon to the great hall of the castle, and there they will ask her to sign an instrument of abjuration. If Joan of Arc signs, it is not yet known what her fate will be, but at least she will be saved from the stake. And if she refuses to sign, well, then the procession will take her to the old marketplace where the executioner and a huge crowd are already waiting. However, there is still no sign of the procession, and my colleague, Quincy Howe, has spent the last few days in an exhaustive investigation of the career of this remarkable girl. And for his report, we take you now to Quincy Howe at our Mobile headquarters. Never before in history has one person risen so swiftly from obscurity to fame as Joan of Arc, maid of Orleans. Of all the amazing feats she is said to have performed, none surpasses this. Joan was born 19 years ago in the little village of Domremy, on the left bank of the river Meuse, just west of the Duchy of Lorraine. Her father is Jacques d'Arc, a simple farmer. From childhood, Joan claimed she saw visions of saints and heard their voices. Then one day, St. Michael appeared to her in the radiant figure of a man poised on wings and bathed in dazzling light. St. Michael told Joan that God had appointed her to drive the English invader from the soil of France. He told her to go and lift the siege of Orleans and put Charles the Dauphin on the French throne. In a remarkable series of adventures, this simple farm girl who could neither read nor write and who dressed like a man reached the Dauphin and persuaded him to make her commander-in-chief of his armies. Clad in white armor and riding a black charger, she inspired the French soldiers to incredible heroism and won great victories. She drove the English forces and their Burgundian allies from Orleans. She led the Dauphin to Reims, where he was crowned King of France. Then, after she had accomplished her holy mission, the English captured her at Compiègne and handed her over to the French for trial as a sorceress. For months, she confounded her learned inquisitors. Always she refused to repudiate her visions. Yesterday, the court condemned her, and today she dies, unless she falters when she sees the stake. Men of logic regard Joan's visions as phantoms of her religious imagination. They consider her military success just a barrel of luck. But to thousands of Frenchmen who revere and follow her, she seems indeed a messenger from God. What the future will think is... Uh, just a moment. Here comes the procession back to John Daly. In a solemn march to the prison castle, the procession is led by a delegation of high churchmen, followed by black-robed Dominican monks chanting a litany. 
There are also English men at arms on horseback and an empty tumbrel. The castle drawbridge is coming down. Perhaps you can hear the rattle of its chains in the background. At the head of the procession, his lordship, Pierre Fauchon, the Bishop of Beauvais, and chief judge at Joan of Arc's trial. Beside him, the Earl of Warwick, who in the absence of the Duke of Bedford, is the commander-in-chief of the English forces occupying Rouen. The drawbridge is down. The Bishop of Beauvais and the Earl of Warwick have stopped here to talk with the captain of the castle guard. The monks are passing on over the drawbridge into the great hall of the castle, where Joan of Arc will be given her final chance to abjure. I've interviewed both Pierre Cochon and the Earl of Warwick before during Joan's trial. Pierre Cochon speaks English, and sir, here's a question I've not asked you before. Has it ever been officially explained why you were chosen as the chief judge for the trial of the maid? It is a simple fact of church government. Jean d'Arc was captured in Compiègne. That is part of my diocese. And so it was my duty to try to save her soul. Your Lordship, it has been rumored that you asked for the privilege of trying Joan of Arc because she'd invaded your diocese and driven you out of it two years ago. I am accustomed to the slander of heretics. I pay them no heed. Well, what of the charges, your Lordship, that the maid's trial was unfair, that two of the judges denounced it as illegal? Quant à cela, monsieur... I will say to that simply that I was congratulated by my superiors of the University of Paris for the great solemnity and the just and holy spirit in which I conducted the trial. I see. And do you think, your lordship, that the maid will recant in the great hall? Jeanne d'Arc, monsieur, is but 19. At this age, life is sweet. I have high hopes that she will recognize the error of her ways. And just what is it that you would like the maid to do? That is very simple. She must confess that the visions and voices she saw and heard did not come from God and sign an abjuration to that effect. But the maid has steadfastly maintained, your lordship, that her visions were divine. But that is not possible, monsieur. One cannot receive communications from the church triumphant in heaven except in accord with the teachings of the church militant on earth. The heresy of this maid of Orléans is that she did not consult with the church and submit to its judgment about her visions. If then her visions were not from saints and angels, they must have been from Belial, Satan, and Behemoth. I see, and that is what the maid must declare now if she is to be saved. That is correct, monsieur. We wish to save this child. We are not interested in her body, but her immortal soul. The body burns only for a few moments, but the soul of a sorceress burns through all eternity. One more question, please, Your Lordship. There are those who suggest that Joan of Arc was condemned for political reasons. I uh, do not wish to comment on that. But if I may, Your I Lordship... Repeat, I do not wish to comment. I am not interested in politics. I must go now into the question. Thank you, Your Lordship. My Lord Warwick, yeah? uh, you came with the Bishop of Beauvais, sir. Aren't you going into the castle with him? Oh, no, 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 no. The saving of souls is for churchmen. My work today is to be rid of the maid, and high time, too. But, my Lord, what if the Bishop of Beauvais is right and the maid recants? Mark me. He'll soon be coming out with the maid. We'll see a fire and smell smoke today. I'll wager every pound and every acre I own that Joan will sign no paper. Do you consider her saint or witch, my Lord? Saint or witch, I know not. But I know the woman. As much as she loves life, she loves what she believes in more. The maid is flesh in her body, but her spirit is steel. How is it, my lord, that when the English captured Joan of Arc, they didn't put her to death immediately? If I'd had the say of it, she'd been tied in a bag and dropped in the river. But no, not these French. They have to try her in court. Meddle with words. Very peculiar people, these French... <laughs> Well, at least they paid us 10,000 pounds for her. <laughs> That's a large sum, my lord. Not for a wench who drove us out of Orleans and smashed our armies at Pate, who set a weakling on the throne of France. And the damage is not yet done. Ah, though Joan of Arc dies today, we'll not see the end of her yet. And what do you mean by that, my lord? But I mean, uh, this maid, this, this peasant girl, has still a mighty following in unconquered France. These French rebels they believe her divine. Even after the faggots have made her ashes, I venture they'll cry her name and fight like devils at the sound of it. Ah, 
we'll be hard put to to hold whatever soil we've already won. And is that why you've given orders to have the maid's ashes thrown into the river Seine? Aye. I, I want nothing left on which to rear a legend for nourishing the spirit of the French. The memory of this maid will be worth a hundred battalions to them. Hmm? What a pity she was not born an Englishwoman. <laughs> Thank you, my lord. The Earl of Warwick has turned to talk with the captain of the castle guard again. The proceedings in the great hall must be ready to start. Don Hollenbeck is there to report them, so let's go inside to the great hall and Don Hollenbeck. Joan of Arc has not been brought from her dungeon yet, but everything appears in readiness. The Bishop of Beauvais is seated at a great table in the center of the hall, surrounded by dignitaries. His face is impassive, stern by the flickering light of the many torches that are stuck on the walls and held by the assembled monks. Those torches throw shadows on the walls and on the ceiling of this. Joan is entering the great hall. She is in chains. Her wrists and ankles are manacled. She's wearing women's clothes, a loose gray robe and hood. That's unusual. Joan has always worn men's clothes. It may be a sign that she'll recant. Father Martin Labrenier, her confessor, is by her side. Joan has reached the table now where Cochon is sitting. The great hall is silent except for the bishop who is speaking to a priest. Joan is a sturdy girl. She's not beautiful, but there's a winning quality about her, simple and direct. The strength of conviction and inner certainty. She's pale. She shows the strain of five months of prison and ceaseless questioning at all hours of the day or night. Her face is calm, almost uh, enigmatic. Pierre Cochon is speaking. Que appelle la pucelle d'Orléans. Écoute bien ceci. Mes frères a donné lecture de l'acte d'abjuration. The Bishop of Beauvais has asked Joan to listen to the oath of abjuration which will be read to her now by uh, Maître Erard, canon uh, of Rouen. Communément appelée la pucelle, m'avoue coupable du péché de sédition du péché de désobéissance, du péché d'orgueil, du péché d'hérésie. Je renonce maintenant à tous ces péchés, les abjure et les abandonne, en foi de quoi je signe de mon nom cet acte d'abjuration. Maître Erard has finished reading the abjuration oath and the confession that Jean, Joan has signed and is willing to repent. Now, Cochon speaking. Dans son infini charité et dans son désir de sauver son âme, sauf cette dernière occasion, que choisis-tu, l'acte ou le bûcher Cochon gives her a last chance, the oath of the stake, and now Joan. Viens d'en haut, pas d'en bas. Je ne les renierai pas. Joan has refused to sign the oath. The judges are all shouting at once, urging her to sign, to live. Mes pères, mes pensées, je vous en prie, ne parlez pas tous à la fois. Vous pourriez vous embrouiller. Joan has cried out, please, good fathers, please, do not all speak at once. You are liable to confuse yourselves. Cochon speaking again. Je refuse. Tu changeras bien d'avis lorsque tu monteras sur le bûcher et qu'on te liera au photo. Qu'on l'emmène. Qu'on l'emmène. Cochon has ordered Joan to be taken from the hall. He said she would yet change her mind when she mounted the scaffold. The monks have begun their chant for the dying. The bishop of Beauvais and the judges have risen. They are walking out of the great hall. Joan is being led after them. Her refusal to sign the oath of abjuration was quiet but unequivocal. She did not seem to waver for a moment. It seemed as if all her mental torture, her long months of struggle and doubt are over, over at last, and that she is now finally and ultimately resigned to die rather than renounce her blessed saints and angels. However, she has yet to face the terrible ordeal of the stake in the old marketplace. There is still time for her to change her mind and save herself. The procession has passed out of the doors of this great stone hall now, so over to John Daly. The crowd here has caught sight of the maid of Orleans. There are some cries of burn the witch, let her burn, but for the most part, most part the people stand looking at John in dumb fascination. The procession has just crossed the drawbridge. The maid is standing, still chained before the empty cart, which is to carry her to the old marketplace. 
Pierre Cochon has raised his hand. The crowd stops its shouting. It's almost silent now. The monks keep chanting, however. The bishop has taken a paper mitre from an attendant and placed it on Joan of Arc's head. There are four words inscribed upon that mitre. I can see them clearly. The words are heretic, relapse, apostate, idolatrous. But now the bishop has motioned to the English men at arms. Ecclesiastical officials are thus releasing the maid and turning her over to secular power. The church has only acted as judge. It will not act as executioner. Two English soldiers are lifting the maid into the cart. The crowd pushes forward. It keeps muttering the words inscribed on that paper mitre. Lord Warwick waves the procession forward, and the cart begins to move, the crowd moving with it. The maid of Orleans leans against the side of the cart, slowly raises her head, and looks down on this crowd. She seems to pity them, not to condemn. Her lips are moving, evidently in prayer. The cart and the procession are moving away, and in a few moments they'll be at the old marketplace where the stake and the executioner are waiting. Ken Roberts is at the old marketplace, so come in, Ken Roberts. The huge mob here at the old marketplace doesn't know that Joan is on her way. The people are thronging this great square, talking, waiting. Some of them have been waiting since dawn for this spectacle. For to most of the Burgundian French here, this is a kind of show, a kind of circus. They've come to see Joan burn, and they want to see her burn. I'm standing at the foot of the scaffold itself. It's really a double scaffold on two levels or platforms, one higher than the other. The executioner and his attendants stand on the lower platform, and the upper one has the stake and the faggots. To the right of this double scaffold, there is another raised platform reserved to the authorities. The space immediately around the scaffold is guarded by English men of arms, keeping the crowd at a distance. From my vantage point, I can see the entire sweep of this vast throng. People choke the square itself and the streets leading into it. People everywhere on rooftops and at windows. It's a huge mob, a vast mob. And, and, and here is one of the French women that is part of it, come to see Joan of Arc burn today. I'm going to ask her whether she thinks Joan may cheat her out of a burning today by recanting. Pardon, madame. Pensez-vous que Jean sera brûlé? Oh, j'espère bien qu'il va brûler. J'ai pas l'intention d'être plus pour l'évêque pour rien voir. Joan had better burn, she says. She's not come all the way from Paul l'évêque. That's about 50 miles west of Rouen to have her holiday ruined. Oui, il y a un homme qui m'a offert 10 sols d'argent pour ma place près du bûcher. A man offered her 10 francs for her place here. Alors? Alors, je lui ai craché à la figure. <laughs> she spit in the man's face, she says. Oui, oui. Merci. She came early, she says, and she won't be cheated. Merci, madame. Now, now here's one of the English guards around the scaffold. Soldier, Joan of Arc is on her way here now. What do you think of that? That's the best news I've heard all morning. The quicker she gets here, the quicker I'll get my dinner. Well, aren't you more interested in what's going to happen to this girl than you are in your dinner? Do you think she'll weaken and recant? No matter to me one way or the other. As long as I get something to eat and a draft of ale. This French dust parches my throat something awful it does. Thank you, soldier. Now, here's the chief executioner himself, also an Englishman. His name is Geoffrey Farage. I've spoken with him before. He wears the familiar black robe and hood of his calling. Master Farage, how do you feel about putting Joan of Arc to the stake? Feel? I have no feeling. It's a matter of business. Aren't you reluctant about it? I can't afford such sentiments. If the maid burns, I'm paid. If she doesn't, I'm not. Thank you, Master Farage. Now, here's a gentleman near the scaffold who looks like a scholar of some sort. He seems to be neither English nor French. I beg your pardon, sir. Do you speak English? I speak many languages, signore. Would you tell us your name, please? I am Alfredo Firenze. I travel about Europe collecting rare manuscripts for the library of the House of Medici in Florence. Oh, I see. You're a Florentine. De Medici is a famous name. Si. And what is your point of view on the burning of Joan of Arc today? I'm a... As a humane man, I naturally do not want her to go to the stake. But as a man with some regard for the future, I hope she will not flinch from her fiery ordeal. Well, that's a surprising thing to say. Would you explain it, please, signor? Si, con piacere. This 19-year-old peasant girl from Doremi does not herself realize the role she is playing on the stage of history. But the flames that rise from this stake will help light a great new political era for Europe. 
political era? Si. I don't quite understand, Signor Ferenzi. It's generally held that the maid has been condemned for religious reasons. Ah, it is a pity, but people do not always see the truth. One must look for the deeper, the underlying motives. But isn't Jones' crime heresy? See, si, political heresy, but let us look not at the cover, but at the pages of this book. The church, Signor, is strong. Its power is dominant throughout most of Europe. A very young girl, Jeanne d'Arc, has arisen, unwittingly challenging a very old institution. She has dared to put a new French king on the French throne. She has inspired the French people with a new and dynamic spirit. Ah, see. Jeanne d'Arc is not aware of it, but she has helped to create a new state. The established order, Signor, does not welcome new states. Severo. That's an interesting point of view, Signor Ferenzi, but... If that's true, why didn't the English drown the maid as soon as they captured her at Compiègne? An excellent question, Signor, but there is an answer to it. The maid of Orléans has done great damage, no? See, si. it can be undone in only one way. She has crowned the French king. There is only one way now to uncrown him, and that is by discrediting him. If Jeanne d'Arc admits that she is a witch, then the French people will say that their new king is the work of the devil, and they will tear him from the throne. Thank you, Signor Ferenzi. The, the crowd around me is calling out, the witch, the witch is coming. People on the rooftops surrounding the square are waving, pointing in the direction of the high road from the castle. It must be, yes, it's the procession. I can see it now, moving through a lane cleared by the English men-at-arms. Tension is spreading through the crowd. It's tightening around the very scaffold itself. People all around me are muttering as if half afraid of the maid's supernatural powers. It's the witch, the witch is coming. I've seen many crowds before, but I've never seen one as fearful and bloodthirsty as this. The burning of heretics is quite customary these days in Europe. Other women have burned before. But this Burgundian mob seems strangely both afraid and yet eager to hear the crackling of the flames. And here is the procession now. It's entering the square. John Daly has come up with the procession in our mobile unit, and he will go to our booth opposite the scaffold and the cart which is just arriving, carrying Joan. In a moment, we'll switch to Daly. The monks, still chanting, are taking their places on the upper platform... Now is silent. Let's listen. signal from the Bishop of Beauvais. The monks have stopped their chanting. The cart is now directly before the scaffold. Joan, as she is lifted from the cart, keeps looking at the scaffold. Her eyes seem fascinated by it, but she utters no cry, although her lips are still moving. She's still praying. Here, Cochon has said something to Joan. I couldn't catch it from here, but whatever it was, Joan has shaken her head fiercely. Lord Warwick has signaled now to the executioner. His assistants have seized Joan. The crowd has suddenly come to life again. This is what they've been waiting for, and they're watching now open-mouthed with anticipation as the executioner's assistants carry the maid of Orleans up to the scaffold. The Earl of Warwick watches calmly. He just glanced at the Bishop of Beauvais, and Thea Cochon looked at him for a moment, his face impassive. Now both men are taking their places with the other dignitaries on the platform. The maid is being chained to the stake by the waist and feet. Her hands are free. She has begun to weep. But her lips move still, evidently in prayer. The crowd is silent again. It seems puzzled by Joan's behavior. The people don't know what to make of her. The Bishop of Beauvais looks down at the maid of Orleans and speaks to her. The Bishop of Beauvais has asked Joan once again to abjure. She doesn't answer. She's trembling, fighting her tears. This is her last chance. And again, Pierre Cochon has asked, Do you abjure, Joan? She raises her head and this time speaks. And once again, finally, she has refused to recant. It was God who sent me, she cried. And now I am going back to him. Tonight, I shall be in paradise. Cochon raises his hand again. The crowd falls silent. Is reading the official accusation. I have a copy of the official accusation in English. Here is the text. Quote, 
Joan of Arc, we reject you, we cut you off, we abandon you to the fire and the flame. We name you these, we accuse you of these, we condemn you of these. Joan of Arc, sorceress, blasphemer, dabbler in magic, pseudo-prophetess, invoker of demons, superstitious, thinking evil of faith, schismatic, sacrilegious, idolatrous, apostate, profane, disturber of the peace, cruelly athirst for human blood, scandalous, seditious, indecent, immodest. And he concludes, let the sentence for the heretic be carried out. That is the end of the accusation. Koshaw has finished reading, and the executioner bends down now to arrange the faggots. Joan of Arc has cried out, give me a cross, give me a cross. The crowd is absolutely silent. No one moves, only the executioner calmly proceeds with his work. And again, Joan cries out for a cross. For the love of God, a cross. A murmur sweeps the crowd, and it's an hysterical murmur. The mood of this mass of spectators seems to have suddenly changed. For only a moment ago, they were crying out almost fiendishly, burn which burns. An English guard has rushed up to the scaffold and handed Joan a cross. It's a rough wooden cross. Seems to have been made hastily from two sticks. Joan of Arc grasps it, raises it to her lips, and now hugs it to her breast. Her eyes are raised to heaven. She's no longer weeping. She's ecstatic. And the man has just cried out in terror. The man has just cried out in terror. God help us. We are burning a saint. The crowd has now completely changed. The people are screaming and shouting. Stop, stop. Don't, don't let her burn. Many have thrown themselves on the ground, are weeping and praying. And even some of the men who condemned her are weeping and praying. But the executioner has put the flame to his torch, and now he is bending and lighting the faggots. The crowd has reacted in one great convulsive protest, and for a moment they're quiet, and then they begin to shout their fear that they have made a catastrophic mistake. They're overcome with guilt and with horror. Too late have revolted against the bloodlust that brought them here. May 30th, 1431. Rouen, France. Joan of Arc is burned at the stake, but her memory is enshrined in the nation she helped create. 478 years later, Joan of Arc was proclaimed by apostolic brief the victim of expiation for the ransom of France. In 1920, Joan of Arc was canonized. The Death of Joan of Arc was another broadcast in the series CBS is There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon. The Death of Joan of Arc was written by Max Ehrlich and Robert Louis Cheon. Next week... April 22nd, 1889. The Oklahoma Land Run. CBS is There. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.